it's not that we necessarily even want people to dress up. We just want people to dress sharp, right? And I think that's a big, big nuance of what our goal is. It's not about business casual or suits or any specific category. I mean, we've seen dress codes change so dramatically in the last decade. Um, dress sharp, right? If you're gonna wear a t-shirt, make sure it's not a ratty t-shirt, right? If you're gonna wear jeans, make sure that they're sharp, kind of monochromatic, no holes, right? And cut to the right length, you know, make sure they're sharp. And so in that way, it's not that you care that much about how you look, it's just that confidence that's built when you feel kind of sharp and clean. This is Start at the Storefront. Today's guest is Aman Advani, co-founder of Ministry of Supply. If you've ever worn a traditional suit, you've experienced the problem that Aman and his co-founder, Gihan, wanted to solve. They're stiff, uncomfortable, and they let the entire world know just how much you sweat. At first, they stitched fabric from their favorite athletic brands into acceptable office wear before developing their own blends. And just to prove how versatile their suit is, co-founder Gihan ran a half marathon while wearing it and was rewarded with the most literal interpretation of proof of concept and a Guinness World Record. So listen in as we cover everything from why there's still a ton of great opportunity in retail, why word of mouth was crucial to their company's growth, and why the inspiration for the company name came from none other than James Bond himself. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we have Amon, founder of Ministry of Supply. For everybody listening, what is Ministry of Supply? Yeah, it's a great question. We are a clothing company based in Boston and founded in 2012. And our focus is pretty simple. It's taking all of the engineering and performance attributes of your favorite gym clothes or lounge clothes, everything that makes those comfortable and perform well, and applying that to your least favorite out of gym clothes. So think dress shirts that are super soft and stretchy, machine washable and wrinkle free. The one thing I would always do when I lived in Boston is, is every summer, right? There's so much finance activity in Boston. So you see all these guys and gals wearing suits and they would walk to lunch. And I would always just stop and salute them because I knew for a fact their backs were just going to be drenched by the time they got back. And it's this uncomfortable predicament, right? Where it's, you don't want to take off your sports coat because we know your shirt's wet. And so your only option is to either wear a shirt under your dress shirt, so that way you hide your sweat, or just leave your sports coat on. A no-win option. That was me. That was absolutely me for a long time. So now those people that you were pitying was exactly why we started <laughs> the company. I was getting on a plane every Monday morning and off a plane every Thursday night and consulting. And uh, you know my clothes were just terrorizing me. And it was this idea of just, get, you get off the plane and your, your back is sweating, your shirt's half untucked, you've got sweat stains. Uh, you got to sometimes try to sneak by the hotel to sneak in a quick iron before you show up to a big client presentation on you know Monday morning at 11. Yeah. And it was just awful. And, and it was exactly why we, we birthed the company was to fight that exact moment of misery. What was some of the science that went into making the fabric? The science is our entire secret sauce, right? Like that's what we care about the most is really the engineering behind the product. So we start by looking at exactly how your body works before we ever touch pen to paper or in our case, CAD for design, right? And so we understand how do you expel heat, odor, moisture, uh, pressure? How do you sweat? How does your skin kind of let that moisture out? How does, you know, we perform strain analysis to see how your skin stretches. And by understanding the body quantitatively before anything, we're, we're starting at a very different point than a traditional design process. So just like the scientific method, we start with a problem or opportunity statement not with an end goal in mind. I just remember this one visual that I would always see. It was uh, basically, it was like the human body and then there was a bunch of like red patches, right? Where the sweat usually comes up. For people listening, I mean, obviously I think people know intuitively, but where are the problem areas where you guys put extra attention, extra fabric on the human body? Yeah, so, so the innovation comes in many forms. It can be fit, it can be fabric, it can be fabrication method, it can be how we construct the garment, whether it's 3D printing, because shaping is really important. So you'll find all over the place little examples of where we took those kernels of problem statements and we infused that performance of technology, sometimes very subtly, whether it be coffee beans and, and the and recycled uh, coffee beans used in the fibers of our dress socks to avoid that odor when you take your shoes off on a plane, let's say. Uh, oh, wow. Whether it be six tiny laser perforations under the arms of most of our dress shirts to expel heat exactly where you let it out that kind of rear portion of the underarm it's just a vent that's providing that airflow um, so you'll see these small nuances all over our garments I mean, almost all of our knits are, are engineered to actually have uh, dynamic ventilation patterns so you'll see that down the center of the back 
um, under the arms, really subtle geometric patterns to allow that heat to escape and really let your body and skin breathe in the way that it intends and wants. Did you have to go through a couple different prototypes before you finally settled on the design where you felt comfortable launching it? Yeah, so I mean, the very first one, and, and, and we were, Diego and I were talking just before the show, the very first product we made, despite about 14 prototypes, and sometimes those were small batches, sometimes those were one of one, you know, we nailed the engineering coming out of the gates. We felt really good about that, um, but we did not feel good about the, the fashion piece of it. It turns out that the engineering piece in isolation is quite simple, right, to, to engineer mm -hmm. a garment. Yeah, that, that's what our backgrounds were. Um, it wasn't until 2013, a year in, that we hired a design director that had come from Brooks Brothers in Theory to make sure that we, we didn't ignore the, the actual problem. It's not just performance. It's how do you marry and gracefully marry form and function, not, not one or the other. What was that like? I mean, was it, was it like magnets at the beginning where you're just, you're clinging quickly or is it just, the, you know, there's a polarity there? What, I mean, how do you even achieve that? Yeah, I mean, early on, we tended to think of it as a bit of a trade-off, right? It is where, right. where you infuse performance, you would lose on aesthetic. And I think over the course of several years, we figured out that actually the two could actually be additive or, or even multiplicative, right? A really flexible fit, for instance, if you infuse stretch in the direct, correct direction and amount across your body, your body could move better even if you had a trim or fitting garment. So you could achieve both a, a comfortable fit but without the restriction, right? Historically, on a broadcloth dress shirt, for instance, you'd pick really good fit, but then you couldn't move, right? You couldn't lift your suitcase up onto the overhead or you couldn't jump onto a, you know, a, a train or you get in the car comfortably without feeling like your shirt's about to come untucked. And so it's a small and simple example I like to give of where form and function can actually play really well together. They don't have to be enemies. And it took us a long time to figure out that the two weren't uh, successful despite each other, but because of each other. I wanted to ask you, so yesterday I had a meeting and I had to put on jeans for the first time in probably quite literally 40 days or something like that. And I've just remembered this, like why this is uncomfortable. And I had, I had purchased the pair that you had recommended, the kinetic pair, and I was trying them and I was like, these, these feel amazing, right? It doesn't feel like I'm making a sacrifice. It feels like it feels comfortable, kind of like the sweatpants thing. Do you think post COVID you're in a prime position to, you know, for your brand, for your company, because now people will seek that, will seek the comfort as opposed to this, you know, uncomfortable garments that we're so used to wearing pre-COVID? Yeah, you know, you're, you're, I think the first person outside of our team to see the silver lining ex exactly the same way we do, which is that we've been trying to convince the world for years that you wanted something as comfortable as your favorite sweatpants, but sharp enough to wear in a more kind of formal, even a casual, just out of home setting. You can't wear those sweatpants to a restaurant or to a bar or to work or to, you know, on a, on a flight, right? And so the entire world learned this lesson all at once that they can be wildly more productive if they're comfortable and that comfort and productivity are actually really directly correlative. And so we've been fighting this fight for so long and all of a sudden <laughs> at, at once the world learned this lesson. And so all of a sudden, instead of us having to educate you on why this matters, we now get to focus all of our attention on, now you know it matters, here's why we're the best at it. And so it really changes our messaging game dramatically to know that everybody has the same opening premise in mind already. And so is there all new marketing going into effect or how are you guys getting the message out there? Yeah, you'll see everything from us kind of continue to evolve. It's one of the things we pride ourselves most on. I mean, whether or not we're in a pandemic, the evolution of our companies are probably our single greatest asset is you'll see constantly us entering new categories, us entering new messaging, us entering a new website or a new you know logo or word mark and, and we love the idea of testing and playing and learning and so absolutely you'll see an extension of our product line that kind of really comfy cozy stuff that we've been doing for years but we'll, we'll kind of blow out now and in, into a, a full collection uh, and then certainly on the messaging side making sure that we remind people or draw back to these days as hey you know things were rough in general absolutely there's no silver lining to that but don't you remember that maybe you were a bit more productive when you threw those sweatpants on and got in front of the computer than when you had your really kind of super tight skinny jeans or your or really restrictive dress pants. I think about it like, um, so, so I saw where one of your co-founders ran a marathon, right? Complete eat your own dog food type startup moment. You're running a marathon in your suits, in your garments. And now I'm thinking like the marketing is just a guy sitting on the couch or a guy or a gal sitting yeah. on the couch on their laptop <laughs> and they might be dressed up, but they feel comfy as ever. And it's like just packaging that message in the right way is, is, is interesting. Yeah, you've nailed a really great nuance that we we have from a messaging standpoint is that line between comfort and performance, right? One is your comfort, you picture the couch and performance, you picture the marathon. 
Right. Um, but actually, both are, are are attempting to do the activity that you're doing in a, in the in the best possible way. Right. If you're if you're lounging, you know, go all out, and if you're running, go all out. And so in that way, the technology that powers the two of those is actually quite complex, but replicable for clothes that are not meant for the track or the couch, but actually, you know, the other 22 hours a day. When you first launched, did you guys bootstrap this company or did you raise a little bit of capital at the beginning? You know, we raised early on um, and it's not necessarily something that I would recommend for, for companies, you know, coming out today. Uh, we raised for two reasons. One is that just seemed like the default. I mean, without, without sugarcoating it, it just seemed like that's sure. what you did when you were starting a company in 2012 as you go out and raise money. You know, the, the question of bootstrapping had become so rare at that point that it wasn't really even a consideration. And we also had a really heavy uphill battle to fight, which I do think required some upfront capital, right? We were taking on a fairly heavy problem, right? At that point, if you went to a Nordstrom, you would have not seen a single item with a single performance you know, characteristic. So we were taking yeah. on a pretty big challenge at that point eight years ago. It's become a bit of a new normal now, which is great for us. But at the time, we were fighting an uphill battle in fashion where it, it wasn't something that the world really was asking for. We had to explain, here's why this matters. How did you address that fight, that uphill battle? How did you turn around and, and educate the market about this problem? Yeah, I mean, I, there's a couple of answers I'd, I'd give there. One is is word of mouth played a huge role and continues to, right? Is that the best way we can do that is by you telling your friends that that was something that you found this to be useful for. So your voice is more powerful than ours. And the second way that comes to mind is that's why we love retail, is retail, we don't have to explain it. You put it on. That aha moment, I get it, happens before you purchase, right? In e-com, those two events are flipped. You purchase, then have your aha moment. And so for us, it was really special to open stores fairly early on. Our first store opened in 2014. You can imagine we launched the company in 2012. That's pretty quick to get that first store up. And it was really because we just saw so much value in getting that aha moment to be the first experience you had, not your credit card. So for you, that aha moment led the decision to even like, because you see a lot of companies now, they just want to do online sales. But with you, you knew that with customers trying on your clothing, it would be more beneficial to you as a brand and informative to them as a consumer than just purely an online format. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I, I'd also not um, cover the power of our own preferences as as a founding team where we like shopping in person right you know i think we are in a lot of ways our own customer and i think one of the interesting things i've seen at, at uh, mit sloan's curriculum is this evolution into user-driven innovation right which is acknowledging that it's okay that sometimes as an entrepreneur you're solving your own problem and uh, and i love retail i love shopping in stores i love touching and feeling and trying on before i buy so I think there was probably some mix of an intelligent business strategy that, that saw really great, you know, conversion rates offline and, uh, and really intimate customer interactions and building kind of true in-depth relationships. And then some part that was just, hey, this would be fun. It would be really great to gather up the people that like our brand, get to hear from them directly and get to shop in a way that we, we enjoy and, and, and hope continues. I love how simply you put things. So you talk about, you bucket things really nicely, comfort, performance, e-commerce, retail, and both of these things make a lot of sense. And so I can like understand your decision-making process. When you think about retail, so for me now as a real estate developer, I've always thought that retail at some point will just become nothing more than a marketing exercise for companies unless they own the asset, in which case then you at least have another asset. But in terms of how you view retail post-COVID, is it like it's a marketing exercise for you? Is it bringing that aha moment to that specific buyer? And then you have your aha moment on the e-commerce where you have to fulfill both roles? Or how, what's your thought process around that? Yeah, I mean, there, there are certainly nuances between the channel that the channels that are not, you know, you can't ignore, right? So, I mean, obviously that the order of events happening, right? You pay before you shop or you shop before you pay. That goes without saying, but I, I, beyond that, I, I do think the channels actually have a lot more similarities than they, did, than they have differences. Where We still think of both. I mean, we won't continue to have a store unless it's four wall profitable. I mean, we're, we're, okay. we're, we're big believers that anything outside of that, unless it is mathematically provable, is, is just a guess and probably a risky one that it's affecting your online business in some massively profitable way, right? Um, we do find that customers are often really tied to a channel. They're either offline shoppers or online shoppers, and they tend to stay with that initial channel mm -hmm. where they purchased. They can complement each other from a messaging or impression standpoint, but when you actually swipe, it tends to be in the same place that, that you prefer. And so we still think of stores as a great way to have commerce and a great place to have, you know, an actual contribution margin coming from. And that leads to these higher AOVs, longer customer relationships, higher lifetime values, 
deeper insights, conversations from our GMs uh, with our design team that are just incredibly informative on what people prefer and what their sentiments are. There's a ton of, of, of opportunity for retail still to be a really, really great channel. I think maybe now more than ever, the intimacy of perhaps fewer people in stores, just, you know, the upside there is more time with the sales you know, associate. So mm. I think, I think it's as alive as ever, as soon as we're able to kind of find a new normal and, and let people be in stores again. When do you think that'll be the new normal? So I know, well, let's skip that question for now. Cause none of us really know. <laughs> How I, much time I, you have? <laughs> yeah. I've seen your store. I think you have one in Fillmore or at least the ones I've seen in San Francisco and then obviously Newberry street in Boston. Um, how big is Ministry of Supply now in terms of your team and in terms of how many stores you have across the country? Yeah, we're about 50 people in total and about, about six stores. Um, all six, as you might imagine, are closed to the public right now. Um, and in terms of reopening, God, your guess is as good as mine, but as soon as we safely can. And in terms of investment, where are you guys at? Did you follow the traditional route, Seed Series A, or what, what was that like? Yeah, we did. We, I mean, it's, it's interesting that that's traditional, right? Um, you're right. <laughs> I, think, I, I, I think you're probably right that that is kind of how, how the the, um, the world has kind of played out. We've always been pretty focused on making sure that we maintain a pretty healthy bottom line too. So in that way, we've, we've balanced, I think, health and growth in a nice way. But no, we, we have absolutely gone and gotten a, a series C, A, and B at this point. And ideally at this point are, are kind of surviving more on revenue than we are on, on uh, outside funding. And what does growth look like for you guys as you think about, I guess, the future post-COVID or, or non? Is it new products? Is it moving more into athleisure, right? You guys started sort of focusing on solving your problem as it relates to suits and dress shirts. Is it moving in that direction or is there a completely new space that you're thinking about? Yeah, it's a really good question. My, my co-founder and partner, Gihan, uh, has a really bright approach to product expansion where he's both the most cautious person in the world when it comes to you know adding new styles but also really loves testing, right? And letting kind of the mm. customer tell us what we have permission to do. So I think over the next year, you'll see quite a few extensions of our brand, some of which will stick around and, and many of which won't, right? Some of which will just be a one-time enjoyable experience for us to launch something new into the world. And others will become part of our core business and maybe a, a significant part of our core business. So an easy example of that being that we launched masks a couple of weeks ago and it quickly became our number one selling product for, for you know, the last three weeks. So I think we'll see that evolution iteration happening quite a bit, but you know, within our playbook, not in, in any sort of inauthentic way. So you go and in, you know, everyone goes on lockdown and you decide to launch masks as a product. How long did it take you before as a team, you were like, okay, we need to move in this direction. And was there a problem in getting supplies with, with everyone being interrupted? Because I heard a lot about supply chains being disrupted and things being put on hold just because, not that they weren't available, but because they were hard to uh, get from point A to point B. Did you experience any of that in creation of the mass as a product? Yeah, we experienced, I think, all of that. Um, yeah. Yeah, we shut our stores down March 11th, and I think somewhere around March 20th or so, we, we kind of got word that this PPE shortage was happening. Our first instinct wasn't until well over a month later, you know, close to a month and a half. We didn't think at all about selling. We never thought we'd sell masks. I mean, even on March 20th, when we kicked that off, it was how many can we get to local Boston hospitals? And we ended up putting a lot of our own money forward, raising money from our customers, and uh, ended up donating over, I think it ended up being 40,000 respirators and another, another 30,000 masks are on the way for over a hundred grand. It was just incredible, I think, to, to watch both kind of our team support and our customer support saying, hey, people need this, let's get it out. It was only once we caught our breath and had delivered 40,000 masks that we even thought about selling the first one and realizing, hey, we still have a, we, you know, we just built the supply chain overnight, you know, for donations. Now that the donations are starting to kind of be, you know, we're, we're continuing to donate one, you know, one for every sell, sale, is there an opportunity for us to make this part of our core business and, uh, and, and go from there? That's exactly what happened. You know, we decided uh, on March 11th not to furlough or fire anybody. You know, we have 30 retail staff members at those six stores. And for, for their livelihood and for our economy, we decided to keep them all fully on payroll. And so we had to make sure we kind of took care of our business. As soon as we took care of our community, our next thought had to be, how do we make sure we sustain our business? And, and that's where uh, selling masks became an option. And with that decision to not fire or furlough anyone, were you also thinking that you would apply for SBA loans or the PPP? And did you go forward with that? Or were the masks enough to kind of 
sustain you? Yeah, so I think I, just just by the nature of our of our investors and, and background, uh, one we don't have a full understanding of where we'll land with with PPP and and anything like that. We haven't applied for anything else, but we, we've explored PPP, but generally are, are kind of keeping that one you know personal until we know more. Um, but but have explored all the programs to see what those benefits and, and helps are, and, and and our only kind of goal is to make sure that. It, if or where we do take any support, we make sure that we use it for the exact intended purpose. So in this case, keeping all of our retail staff employed, uh, although from home and, 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 and not in revenue generating positions, that that's what PPP was built for. So that's why we felt comfortable exploring that. I know you have your son uh, in the room. Are you guys making or expanding to, do you guys do children's clothing? We did one uh, a, a, a sock as an April Fool's Day joke a couple of years ago, but now beyond that, uh, we have un- unfortunately not gone any further. I think down the road, it's entirely possible. I think our, our brand's premise is very much scientifically better blank. Mm-hmm. And there's no reason that uh, children's clothing or children's anything shouldn't be scientifically better than, than what's out there. That's so true, especially if it's washable, right? That's the whole secret. <laughs> when you think about a potential uh, exit plan for you guys, do you think about that often? Do you think about acquisition or do you think about something that you just want to run? You know, this is your baby and you just want to, you want to run it for, for the foreseeable future. Yeah, it's a really good question. It's one that comes up a lot. You know, my, th- th- this is our baby. Um, much like you're the at baby that point. that's about five feet away from me right now. <laughs> you're in the eight to 10 year window, you know, you're in that, that moment. Yeah. You know, I think we, we, we'd always kind of rejected the question early on, mostly just because it, it, we, we didn't start this. We weren't entrepreneurs. We, we still don't think of ourselves as entrepreneurs. And I think this idea of kind of an entrepreneurial journey or a serial entrepreneur have never really appealed too much to us. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've made commitments to our investors that we very much need to deliver on. Um, you know, we've made that, that, that commitment to them and we want to be, you know, hold true to it and, and we're on track to do so. Um, but in terms of exit or liquidity event, these are things we tend not to really think about, but we've generally kind of held close and presented to investors up front from a timeline perspective is that we'll continue to build a really valuable business that is driving value to customers and to our investors in that order. And, uh, and, that, and that the right thing will happen as a result of that, right? If we build meaningful value, then everybody wins, right? And so I think in that way, we've just stayed the course on that. And if and when the right opportunity comes up to find a new partner, we're certainly open to it, but uh, I don't think you'll see us seeking any sort of kind of exit liquidity event anytime soon. Well, you guys are in prime position. I mean, I really love how I remember buying a shirt probably when you first started your very first store. You had a store in the South End, I believe. It was like your very first shop. And I remember going in there and it was like appointment only. I think I can't. I think it's, I think so anyway. I remember knocking on the door. It was locked. And I think <laughs> I bought a shirt. And then quite literally, I mean, I was just thinking like, clothes has to change. I don't want to put on jeans anymore. As, I'm a, as a real estate developer, I, I almost always wear jeans to every public hearing. And every time I'll have a public official come over and say, hey, where's your suit? And I'm like, hey, I play this like tech guy. I'm like, hey, I'm a tech guy. And this is my suit, you know, because I have a sports coat on. And it's this like, ha 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 moment. But as I was thinking about this, and we have a hearing coming up on June 17th, I thought I should probably get some slacks. And then it was like the daunting, all the feeling of those slacks just hit me. Like, I really don't want to put these on. And then I immediately thought of you and I thought, let me, let me at least send an email and say, well, you know, what, what is the pair to buy? And sure enough, I tried them on uh, two days ago when they arrived and game changer. It was amazing. So, I mean, it's, it's a really great, uh, great point on kind of this idea of rejecting an entire category like suits. Um, One of the things we have in our internal speak, we, we don't tend to use it externally, but it's this idea of clothes you actually look forward to wearing. And yeah. that kind of dread that you felt is the exact emotion that we want to eradicate. Like if you brought our entire business down to one point, it's that moment of dread that you just felt. How do we get rid of that? How do we end that? Right. And I think that's exactly what we're going after is that you don't think suit. Oh no. You think suit. Oh, I have that one suit and I really enjoy wearing it. Although I don't wear it when I don't have to, when I do, I look forward to it. Do you think you could ever get people working out in suits? Is that is that like a, a big, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> big audacious hairy goal of yours? You saw Gihan running that marathon. No, I, we, we, <laughs> I, 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 you know, it, I, I'm the first person to throw on a pair of gym shorts when the time is right, or a pair of. Gym <laughs> so uh, it's it's not that we necessarily even want people to dress up. We just want people to dress sharp, right? And I think that's a big, big nuance of what our goal is. It's not about business casual or suits or any specific category. I mean, we've seen dress codes change so dramatically in the last decade, and they really have sh- shifted from this really prescriptive, here's exactly what to wear 
to a much more descriptive, here's how to dress, right? Um, dress sharp, right? If you're gonna wear a t-shirt, make sure it's not a ratty t-shirt, right? If you're gonna wear jeans, make sure that they're sharp, kind of monochromatic, not no holes, right? And cut to the right length, you know, make sure they're sharp. And so in that way, we give ourselves permission to do whatever in terms of category, um, including gym, right? We love gym. We want to enter gym even more. But when you're working out, make sure it's sharp, right? It's not that you care that much about how you look. It's just that confidence that's built when you feel kind of sharp and, and, and clean. Pricing something I always love talking to founders about because you're in a category where suits can range. I mean, people can buy a $5,000 suit, $2,000 suit. I can go to Jose Bank and maybe spend 200 or whatever, right? And so how is it that you guys arrived at your price point when you could have theoretically gone way higher, right? Because you're competing in a, in a category that people are used to spending a lot of money. So how, what was that like? Yeah, it, it probably comes back to one of the statements I made earlier on this idea that we're not necessarily you know, in this for the same reasons as your average startup in that we didn't just want this to be kind of big and, and you know, um, exclusive, right? And a luxury brand. The idea that I couldn't afford one of our own pieces was terrifying as a you know mm. 26 year old founder who he did only had one paying job you know at that point in his life right that was a pretty low bar so even though the idea of charging over hundred dollars for a dress shirt really bothered me for a long time and I think you know inflation's caught up in, in our in our customer uh, you know we have opportunities to cut that down on an occasion but I don't think we ever want to be a company that that makes clothes that are truly just absolutely inaccessible because I think it would hurt on an emotional level that that we were excluding, you know, a, a large audience on price point, right? That's going to, any, any price point will exclude somebody, but to the degree we could, I, we wanted to lean into premium, not luxury. Affordable luxury. There we go. Something like that. Yeah. I always do the fashion people like do, what do they, how do they view your, your company, your products? You know, the, the mega elites, let's call them the snobs of the fashion world. Yeah, you know, early on we used to we used to kind of uh, I think probably just as a bit of a defense mechanism say like they, they were rejecting us because we were confusing them, right? We were <laughs> trying to create a new category of clothing that was that was you know the antithesis of a department store, right? If we're a new department in that way, it's it is you know jarring, right? When we say this, you know, early on we used to use this phrase performance professional, and now we maybe say more like smart, comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but this idea of taking you know your active wear sportswear and and you know formal wear and kind of mixing them all into one big batch doesn't work well for a department store or the average fashion designer who thinks very categorically and department focused i think probably early on we just weren't executing that well right in those first couple of years we were so focused on engineering that we were missing the fashion element and and so i think it took us growing into that i i'd say in in, in their defense they were probably right to reject us early on as we had a lot of stuff to fix and i think you know fortunately five six seven years removed from that period of our kind of early growth uh, and our confidence being high and our team being spectacular that, that now uh, not only have we evolved, but the industry has evolved. And, and now there's a really great marriage where we are, we embrace and love the fact that we're in fashion. I think early on, we used to almost say we're, we're a tech company that happens to make clothing that today we, we feel the opposite and we, we embrace the fashion industry. And I think, I think it's reciprocated and it's hard, hard to say credit at a higher level, but I think the, uh, the fashion industry as a whole has really started to embrace, not just us, but in general, the idea of evolution, iteration, uh, and new in a way that we really appreciate. Leaning into the the industry itself, I want to know how did you settle on the name and and, or, and who came up with it? It's it's, it's evocative. It, we love the name. It's um, Q from the Bond films. We all love uh, a, a good Bond film and, and the character Q, who makes all of Bond's gadgetry right. So all the things that make Bond head head to that gala, but still be ready for anything. Right. Q we say is the ultimate empathetic inventor. He's thinking what could Bond possibly need today and how can I make it seamlessly fit into his persona into his body. Right. And so similarly, we think of ourselves as Q and you, the customer is Bond. How can we make sure that you look just pristine and perfect, but you're ready for absolutely anything that your day may throw at you. And so we are Q and it happens that Q is a real person based on a real person, Charles Fraser Smith, who operated under the cover of the Ministry of Supply. And so in that way, we were, we're Q, we're operating under the cover of Ministry of Supply and your bond. And so it just fit quite naturally that that would be, uh, that would be our company's name. And similarly, our, our customer services, Q at ministryofsupply.com for that exact reason. That is pretty amazing and, and really <laughs> cool so that your whole company is based around something as iconic as as Q and James Bond. I mean that as far as the fabric of your company, that's pretty suave and 
and really <laughs> it elevates you guys. I would imagine it elevates your thinking to a sort of global level like James Bond. It's fun. We enjoy the, again, it comes back to this idea that we, we started this to have a little bit of fun and to enjoy it and make products we really loved. And I think the uh, the Q story just reminds us of this idea that, that empathy and invention are really the two critical ingredients for our process. Just playing off the James Bond, what uh, I'm wondering out loud, and, and maybe you've thought of this, like what would it take to be the official clothing supplier of a Bond film? We've never approached it, but we, we've definitely thought about it. We, we've said we should maybe just drop a couple packages in the mail and see what happens. But yeah, um, definitely a conversation worth having. Maybe we'll do it for the, for whoever the new Bond ends up being. You know, if anyone uh, uh, deserves clothes that you can be athletic in and comfortable and look sharp, it's Bond. I mean, with all the, the stuff that he does. Yeah. It would be a, a company defining moment if we were able to get that. One of the questions we'll wrap on two, two questions here. The, one of the ones I, I always ask people is like, as an entrepreneur, what advice would you give for people holding out on the sidelines? But I really want to, I'm curious in your answer, because to your point, you guys, you said you don't view yourself or as like a serial entrepreneur. And so what advice would you give someone who's either looking to solve a problem or, or start a company? I don't, I'm going to leave it there. I don't know how you think about uh, this. I'll, I'll give you, I, I think two distinct answers, two distinct questions, but I'll, I'll mix them together a little bit. The first, in terms of advice that we got that I'll just pass forward and I won't take any credit for, but I loved was find believers, don't spend your time convincing non-believers. And this idea that the second somebody really doesn't like your idea, learn from them, don't don't dismiss it, but make sure you find those people that believe in it and still push you, right? The idea of, of it not necessarily being a, a, a yes man, right? But, but rather someone who believes in your vision, but challenges you on how to get there. Um, and I think that's just been critical for us, whether that's finding customers who are believers, finding investors, team members who are believers. Um, but the second you get that kind of, hey, this person really just doesn't like the vision, then, then I think move on and, uh, and, and, and keep searching. And I think in terms of, of, of the second question, which may be kind of a, just a, a nice part two of that answer is just this idea that this stuff's really hard. It, it is difficult. It is emotional. It is stressful. It is, it is at times the most fun you can possibly have uh, and at other times the, the hardest work you've ever done. And so one of the things we always tell people is, if you're doing it because you saw white space on, an, you know, on, on a diagram you drew in a business school whiteboard, you'll get burned out pretty quickly and you'll, you'll end up kind of leaving and, and wasting a lot of time. If, if you're doing it because you're genuinely passionate about the problem and the product that you're using to solve that problem, then you'll get through those, those tough parts and you'll get to really celebrate and enjoy the, the, the best parts. But if I didn't love clothing and, and, and its impact on, on the world and its impact on my productivity and my own kind of dreams, let alone our customers, if I didn't love it as much as, as I did, um, or if my partner Gihan didn't, you know, both of us would have gone years ago because it's, it, it's an industry that can absolutely kind of eat you up if you're not uh, in it for the right reasons. I love that. That's so true. And lastly, where can everybody find you? Where, where can everybody find the company, the brand, Instagram, all that good stuff? Yeah, I mean, it started at ministryofsupply.com just because our stores are still shut down, of course. Yeah. Um, our Instagram feed's pretty fun. That's, of course, Ministry of Supply. So look us up, M-I-N-I-S-T-R-Y-O-F-S-U-P-P-L-Y, and uh, and check us out uh, on any of those channels. When the stores open up, we've got six stores around the country that we would very much enjoy having you at. And I love it. I think you guys are in a prime position. I mean, at least for me personally, to reconnect with you 10 years later, pretty much. Um, and I think you nailed it. I think there's a big silver lining. If anything, the hope, the hope is there for you guys. And, um, the product is certainly, uh, amazing. I mean, amazing. And, and the timing of this, right. It's like, you're going to be a genius in 10 years. People are going to be like, how did he know this post COVID <laughs> world needed this product? <laughs> we hope so. We're having some fun in the meantime. Well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast, Amon. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Steve, both. Thanks for having me.